This teaching is called the wilderness. Most of us can testify of that one person who have influenced our Christian walk profoundly. I have two mentors in my life that impacted my Christian walk in such a way. When I think of the caliber or authenticity of the example they've set and how they impacted those around them, I consider myself immensely blessed to be one of those whom Father have led to these individuals. And even though I do not know them in person, I do understand that the same spirit that worked in them is the same spirit that drew me to them like a magnet and is now working in me. My gratitude towards Father's mercy in this regard cannot be expressed in words. And these two mentors of mine are Arthur Katz and Madame Jean Guion. In fact, I can safely say that I consider them my mother and father in the spirit. I've been under their teachings for over 20 years and I can easily say that their books and teachings I've listened or read numerous times. At times I even sound like them in my teachings. I can be very practical and direct as to the cost involved and in the next teaching more mystical and poetic in a way. Our father used Arthur Cutts to install a jealousy in me for that which is authentic. That meant he had to deal with everything in me that is false down to the last particle of my dust particle of my being. He used him to give me an understanding of the prophetic and the apostolic call upon the church, what it means to truly be an apostle and to truly be a prophet. Arthur Cutts' main focus was to prepare the church for the coming tribulation and her role as a means to be a mercy in the wilderness to those who will be dispersed from out of Jerusalem the Jew first, and then the Gentile, all over this world. One would think that someone of this caliber would have had many views on his channel, and yet few of his teachings have over a hundred views. It took me years to share his teachings with others, simply because I'm jealous for the value and depth of wisdom, careful not to cause these pulls, very precious pulls, before swine. And I cannot but feel that this has been the same sentiment of those who have been under his tutorage. This then also formed the foundation and the heart of my previous channel, The Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation. Where art cuts have built the foundation in my life with regard to the prophetic and apostolic reality, Father used Madame Guion to teach me his ways with regard to sanctification. The one tutor, very practical and direct, the other more mystical and veiled. There has been much said about Madame Guion through the years, where people have tried to discredit her as a mystic, which she was not. And much of the Christian writings of the 1500s to the 1700s are written in a very poetic style, where the thou's and thine's causes many to turn away. Also, many of these writings are done by Roman Catholics, of which Madame Guion was as well. We have to remember that scripture was limited to that of the papacy. Only later, because of Luther, was it made available to the public, who at that time few could read. Only those that were well off were taught at a young age to read, of which Madame Guion was. Many miracles came through this woman that endured much for the kingdom of God. However, the Roman Catholics of that time and now are vastly different, and to cast away the baby with the bathwater in this regard would just be heartbreaking. Even King James at the time was a Roman Catholic, of which we have the King James Bible. Now, I'm not saying it was without fault, just that Father used Roman Catholics at that time. Wisdom remains the principal thing. This does not mean that we accept all Roman Catholic writings. Having said all this, I'd like to quote from a book compiled by Jean Edwards called The Hundred Days in the Secret Place. This book contains three of my favorite author's writings of that time, being Francois Fenelon, Madame Guion, and Miguel de Molano. I will be quoting Molano as well. My mentor, Arthur Katz, as well as A.W. Tozer, Levin, uh, Leonard Ravenhill, are some of the saints who have often quoted Madame Guion. I consider these men giants in the faith. This is what Jean Edwards said about her in this book. He says, few people are aware of the incredible influence Jean Guion had on the Christian family for the last 
300 years, more so than some were founded denominations and perhaps all of the great and famous names of Christian history. Only one author from the century in which he lived out sells her. His name is William Shakespeare. In fact, they are the only two writers of the 1600s whose books are still very popular. Now, Jean Guion is the most read woman in Christian history. Even now, her influence covers the globe. Her books have been published in all major languages. No one has ever written with the depth that this woman has. Her words are to be taken to heart and cherished. She is a Christian author without parallel. He continues saying, Jean Guion was born in 1648. By the time she reached the age of 30, she was one of the most influential Christians in France. Nonetheless, it seems she could not stay out of trouble with the Catholic Church. She was imprisoned in the nunnery of Anthony even before she was well known. She was later arrested on several occasions. Those arrests were based more on the jealousies and intrigues within the court of Louis XIV than anything about her writings or her life. Guion was finally forced to stand before a tribunal of inquiry. She was judged on her biography and her books, The Song of Songs and Spiritual Torrents. Louis XIV hated this woman and had her arrested. As punishment, she was first interned in the Tower of Vincennes and later transferred to the Bastille. Guion's autobiography, which was written for private inspection, has become one of the greatest biographies in Christian history. You will not find any writer of any generation who has reached the depths that she has reached. Read here and read her well. She is the best that the Christian faith has to offer, especially for those looking for a deeper walk with Christ. End of quote. Her autobiography is also available on our website on the library page. Our library page is where I supply you with a list of books that I've personally read and have gained much wisdom through the years. I supply links to free PDF downloads or websites for easy access. My mentor's books are available on there, as well as Jean Edwards' books. I also have a books page where I provide you with free PDF links to the books that I've written. The Enochian Bride specifically covers the topic of today and is written from the bride's perspective in the wilderness. Please make use of these and endeavor to understand these ways. I ask no money for it. Freely I've received, freely I give. The website is not only so that you can have a transcript to the teachings, but it is also to be a resource for you to grow in. So today we will be talking about the wilderness and the mysterious ways of God in our hearts, sanctifying us for his purposes. These writings that I will quote with the teaching itself will minister and strike a familiar chord with you in regards to Father's dealings with you in the wilderness thus far. I will be speaking specifically about simplicity, solitude and silence, the three keys of sanctification. I speak on this on the His Fair Maidens website's tabernacle page as well, should you want to learn more. The sanctification process is represented by the inner court, the circumcising of the heart, where the outer court is about the circumcising of the flesh. This is therefore an inner work done by the spirit in the soul of man. Man's soul consists of our thoughts, this includes imaginations and human understanding. It consists of our emotions and our will. As with all his ways, there are degrees or depths that he guides us into dealing with every part of the soul of man in sanctification. He knows exactly where you are in the process of sanctification and what you can handle. He requires more of those whom have given him much already. In other words, he is patient and builds you up in order to eventually be able to die to everything. 
The inner court is where his bride is made virginal and prepared as a priest unto him. His workers are his priests and priests are living sacrifices just as our high priest was. He was both the high priest and the sacrifice. So I will start therefore with a quote from Madame Guion regarding our disposition towards the cross. This is what she says. She says, you must be patient in all the suffering that God sends you. If your love for the Lord is pure, you will love him as much on Calvary as on Mount Tabor. The Lord Jesus loved his father on Mount Tabor where he was transfigured, but he loved him no less on Calvary where he was crucified. Surely then you should love the Lord as much on Calvary for it was there that he made the greatest display of his love. There is a possibility that you might make a mistake concerning your abandonment to the Lord. You may abandon yourself to the Lord hoping and expecting always to be caressed and loved and spiritually blessed by him. You who have given yourself to the Lord during some pleasant season, please take note of this. If you gave yourself to him to be blessed and to be loved, you cannot suddenly turn around and take back your life at another season when you are being crucified. Nor will you find any comfort from man when you have been put on the cross. Any comfort that comes to you when you are knowing the cross comes to you from the Lord. You must learn, <clears throat> sorry, you must learn to love the cross. He who does not love the cross does not love the things of God. It's impossible for you to truly love the Lord without loving the cross. The believer who loves the cross finds that even the bitterest things that comes his way are sweet. The scripture says, to the hungry soul, every bitter thing tastes sweet. That's in Proverbs 27, verse 7 and B. How much do you desire to hunger after God, she asked. You will hunger after God and find him in the same proportion that you hunger after the cross. Here is a true spiritual principle that the Lord will not deny. God gives us the cross, and the cross gives us God. Note that she's not referring to the redemption or salvation by the cross, but rather the applying of the cross in sanctification, which is to love the cross we take up daily. As mentioned, God works in degrees with us. Often, I often use the analogy of an onion, same onion, different layers. Therefore, we will often find ourselves dealing with the same issues we thought we have died to. Naturally, we think we have not when we see familiar reactions indeed or emotions. But very often it's the same issue or onion, but a different aspect or depth that he is working in us. We have to be patient and walk in stride with the Spirit through this wilderness. The same is true about God's gifts. When I say gifts, it's not the gifts of the Spirit as per 1 Corinthians 12, but the gifts that come through suffering. Of course, when he presents them to us, it's not wrapped up in a neat little bow, but rather to the undiscerning eye, it appears to be not a present, but pain. Such is the case with the three keys of sanctification being simplicity, solitude and silence. Depending upon where you are in your personal walk with the Lord, you will experience all three of these in different degrees in the wilderness, where the outer court represents the world that we have come out of. The inner court represents our wilderness walk. Canaan is ultimately the goal. Understand that those who have gone through their own wilderness will be able to be a mercy unto those who in the tribulation will find themselves in a wilderness as well. Considering what the tribulation will be like, is it any wonder why your wilderness is so difficult? 
what he is presently working in you will be of immeasurable value to those you will minister to. Note that in Hosea 2, that in order to become his wife, she has to go through a wilderness first. You will remember that when the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, they soon lusted after the flesh pots and the dainties of Egypt. This is because even though they have left Egypt, Egypt in fact have not left them. As Paul in contrast to this says that he has died to this world and the world to him. And this is the reason for the wilderness, to get Egypt out of us. We're going to discuss Hosea 2 in this teaching. So get your pen out, be ready to underline, and listen with a discerning ear. Please note, Hosea was told to marry a woman of whoredom to show the whoredom of Israel prophetically. At the same time, understand that a woman of whoredom is a reference in Scripture to the Gentiles. They were women of whoredom because they worshipped not the true God. Yeshua marrying a Gentile bride, a woman of whoredom, is an indictment against Israel. Where Israel should have received mercy, the Gentiles receive mercy in order to provoke them to jealousy as per Romans 9 to 11. So I'm going to discuss the whole Hosea too, but listen to it with your own journey through your wilderness in mind. He has chosen her, but he has to prepare her. It starts with declaring her not to be his wife, to ending it with her becoming his wife. He has to deal with her and with all her idols. These idols come in different forms. Understanding that we are talking about the inner court. We will be reading and commenting on the scripture in context with that which is unseen, the matters of the heart. Idols, therefore, in this context, would be approval, applause, affirmation, significance, spiritual ministry and ambitions, your dreams, gifts of the Spirit, to be loved, to be heard, to be right, to be pitied, to be consoled. All these constitute motives. The Word clearly tells us that we are to guard our heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Remember that the sword of the Spirit, yielded by our High Priest, is to cut up the sacrifice, which we are, dividing between soul and spirit, bone and marrow, and is a discerner of the motives and intents of the heart. So here in the inner court, the bride grows in great intimacy and knowledge of the bridegroom and her high priest. So let's read Isaiah 2 in context with what I've just shared. Starting at verse 1. Say ye unto your brethren Ami and to your sisters Ruhama, Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife. Neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her wardens out of her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Remember, Jerusalem is the mother of all. This is why there will be a new Jerusalem. Hosea, however, married a woman of whoredom, a Gentile. In fact, the Lord God is telling them through this marriage that they are as the Gentiles, adulterers. Note, he is addressing that what she looks at. He wants her to remove her wardens out of her sight. So the eyes here represent the lusts of the flesh. But more importantly, that which we look to is that which we depend upon. This is why he continually tells us, look unto me. The adulteries between her breasts are a reference to the adultery in the heart. Verse 3. Lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day that she was born, and make her as a wilderness, 
and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. He's exact in his description of what he will do with her. He will strip her naked. He will cause her to be utter dependent upon him as a newborn. He will make her as a wilderness. And he will make her a dry land. And lastly, slay her with thirst. No walk in the park. This is the purpose of your wilderness journey. Ultimately, to kill you so that out of your death, new life may come forth. The old Jerusalem has to be destroyed to become the new Jerusalem. He has to strip her naked in order to clothe her. The length he is willing to go to strip her of everything appears to be immensely cruel. And indeed, in a sense, his love is very cruel in its jealousy for her. Many trials of his choosing she has to endure. And this wilderness seems endless. Her greatest enemy, not that without, but within. Here she is taught to endure to the end, even to the point of death where she can authentically say, though he slays me, yet will I praise him. In fact, often she will feel as if she has now finally died to all things after so many years, only to find to her dismay that she has not. And to not give up in those moments is what fortifies her. During this wilderness, he does refresh her every now and then. And then that seems like fresh water in a parched land. And through the years, he eventually stays away longer, increasing her devastation, ultimately slaying her with thirst. Madame Guion says the following in her book, Spiritual Torrents. O oh, rigorous lover, innocent murderer, why dost thou not kill with a single blow? Why give wine to an expiry heart and restore life in order to destroy it afresh? This is thy sport. Thou woundest to the death, and when thou seest the victim on the point of expiring, thou healest one wound in order to inflict another. Alas, usually we die but once, and the very cruelest murderers in times of persecution, though they prolonged life, it is true, yet were content to destroy it but once. But thou, less compassionate than they, Take us away our life time after time and restore us it again. O oh, life which cannot be lost without so many deaths. O oh, death which cannot only be attained by the loss of so many lives. Perhaps the soul after thou hast devoured it in thy bosom will enjoy its beloved. That would be too great a happiness for it. It must undergo another torture. It must be buried and reduced to ashes. But perhaps it will then arrive at the end of its sufferings, for bodies which decay suffer no longer. Oh, it is not thus with the soul. It suffers continually, and burial, decay, and nothingness are even more sensibly felt by it than death itself. In verse 4 he says, And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. Now, children, in the context that we are speaking, represent that which is produced from out of our humanity, your own understanding, and with your selfish motives of the heart. He does not bless and shows no mercy on that which is of the flesh or soul, even if it is done for spiritual reasons or ministry. During this process, she later reaches a stage where she ends up feeling as if she means nothing for the kingdom of God and that she never will. She feels useless and longs to serve him, but the time has not yet come. Her life seems an endless journey of suffering. She longs to die in all things, for she thinks then the suffering would cease. 
that which she previously did for him dies and she becomes as one who has never did those things before. She becomes barren and can no longer produce. This is a great agony for her, but serves to kill spiritual ambition, which is much needed. This too, by degrees. She has to be willing even not to be used by him. What he asks of her during this time are like stabbing wounds of a knife into her heart, which, if it was not for her devotion for him, she never would have endured or conceded to it. Verse 5. For their mother have played the harlot. She that conceived them have done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. This is much like the Israelites in the wilderness crying out, Did you only bring us into the wilderness to die? Is it not better for us to return to Egypt? Note three particular areas she fornicates in, which is the body, soul and spirit. Number one, the bread and water points to physical needs. Number two, wool and flax points to religious works of the soul trying to please God through works. Sometimes an obsession with sanctification becomes religious works because she does not understand that it is he who sanctifies. She thinks that her obedience will cause him to accept her, not knowing that he loved her before she knew him. She only needs to rest. And the wilderness is the place where she learns to walk by faith in obedience to the spirit, which is his rest. Number three, the oil and drink refers to ministry, that which is of the spirit of man, where the Pharisee lies hidden in guile. This is a very subtle and usually the last to die. Her lovers are those who feed and clothe her with that which she desires from her wicked heart, which is that approval, love, acceptance, spiritual ministry and ambitions, gifts of the spirit and many more idols of the heart. She is led by these desires and therefore goes after her lovers. Verse 6 and 7, Therefore, behold, I will hedge up thy way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her paths. And she shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them. And she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. Here you can see how he then, in his jealous love, causes her to not be able to find these lovers anymore. This is a literal process of elimination that increases a great sense of loneliness. She has nothing in common with those she used to spend many hours with. Gradually, he strips her and he does this by exposing her heart through various circumstances. He removes these lovers, which used to bring a great satisfaction and consequently no longer does. Even that which is spiritual. Once again, this is by degrees. Many layers have to be removed and he leaves nothing undone. This includes emotional healing, which is often a great door from which these selfish and natural motives stem. Note, I said selfish and natural motives. This is where she will be seen as extreme, for it's only natural in the eyes of those who look upon her for her to want certain things in life. But they do not understand this level of death simply because they have not yet entered into it. They are still partial in their devotion. As she progresses in the wilderness, he strips her completely until she is naked. Consequently, she is either an offense or an inspiration to those who see her in this wilderness. Verse 8. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil. 
and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. This is a reference to Ezekiel 16, where the word of the Lord came to him to prophesy to Israel that he found her as a newborn child unwanted by the roadside, still unwashed and unsalted, and that he betrothed himself to her after he brought her up and gave her wine, corn, garments and jewellery. To his dismay, she goes and gives these gifts to other lovers. In the context of the inner court, this constitutes that which he gives us spiritually and how we even fornicate with this in order to satisfy our selfish motives of the heart. A good example of this would be how worldly worship music and Christian movies have become and the awards and money won for their talents and gifts. That would be the praise and approval they seek. A very thin line indeed. Closer to home, this would be how we desire secretly a thank you or at least recognition for a job well done, some form of acknowledgement or ministering to others and receiving their praise, even if they say, I know it's not you but God, but within your heart you secretly hide the idol in your tent between your hearts or between your breasts or testifying of what he has done for you in the guise of giving him honor, whilst deep in your heart you relish the attention. Understand that these motives can be very subtle and constitute guile. Because of this, he tells her in verse 9 and 10, Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof, and my wine in the season thereof, and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of my hand. Here he even spoils her temporarily from her spiritual gifts, although she feels it's permanent. It's in this state of nakedness where she's looked upon by those around her as someone who always suffers, who've been seemingly forsaken as they contemplate her struggle in this wilderness. They do not understand her internal suffering and why she would go so far as to leave family, friend and the things of this world, even to the point where she no longer finds any satisfaction in any consolation they can give. She has died to this world. And the world is slowly dying to her. And she, in fact, has become as a wilderness, dry and barren. She is surrounded by thorns and a wall is set around her so that she cannot reach them. Neither can they reach her. She's brought into utter isolation. Madame Guion says, O oh, poor soul, what art thou become? Formerly thou wast the delight of thy bridegroom, when he took such pleasure in adorning and beautifying thee. Now thou art so naked, so ragged, so poor, that thou darest neither to look upon thyself, nor to appear before him. Those who gaze upon thee, who after having so much admired thee, see thee now so disfigured, believe that either thou hast grown mad, or that thou hast committed some great crime which has caused thy beloved to abandon thee. They do not see that this jealous husband who desires that his bride should be his alone, seeing that she is amusing herself with her ornaments, that she delights in them, that she is in love with herself, seeing this, I say, and that she sometimes ceases looking at him in order to look at herself, and that her love to him is growing cold because her self-love is so strong, is stripping her, and taking away all her beauties and riches from before her eyes. Verse 11 I will also cause all her mirth to cease, her feast days, her new moons and her sabbaths, and all her solemn feasts. Basically, this means that she's stripped from all joy. She goes into a deep depression that comes in waves. Her isolation causes her to feel utterly forsaken. Whatever feast she partook in no longer brings her joy. And by feast I mean not only the holy days, but the table she used to sit at. Even to the point of no longer finding any joy in the reading of scripture and prayer. The heavens have become brass 
and she does not hear his voice. Not because she's lazy and no longer wants to do it, but because he has brought her to this place. This death is so total where she dies spiritually as well. This to her is more than she can bear. She can later no longer enjoy anything. Nothing brings her joy and all is vanity. This is where she feels utterly forsaken by God as if he has finally turned his face away from her in anger whilst the opposite is true. He has never been so close to her as at this point of complete death. She is a savour of life unto him in her suffering because she is enduring it for him. Madame Guion further says, If she was confused when at first her riches were taken from her, her confusion at the sight of her nakedness is infinitely more painful. She cannot bear to appear before a bridegroom, so deep is her shame. But she must remain and run hither and thither in this state. What? Is it not even permitted to her to hide herself? No, she must appear thus in public. The world begins to think less highly of her. It says, is this that bride who was once the admiration of angels and of men? See how she has fallen. These words increase her confusion because she is well aware that her bridegroom has dealt justly with her. She does what she can to induce him to clothe him, her a little, but he will do nothing. After having thus stripped her of all, for her garments would satisfy her by covering her and would prevent her seeing herself as she is. Verse 12 And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, whereof she have said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. Note, in his jealous love, he grants her nothing. All her works become as dung, and she gradually enters into a pure devotion to the point where she forsakes all for the excellency of knowing her bridegroom and high priest. Verse 13 and 14. And I visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and forget me, saith the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness, and speak comfortably unto her. The word comfortably is H3820 in the Strong's Concordance, and it means inner man, mind, will, heart, and understanding. It means the soul of man, the seat of emotions and passions, the seat of courage. Many are there who say that they are unable to hear the voice of God. They long to hear him speak to them as he does to others. It's true there are those who by his grace have a receptivity and discernment in this regard, but this does not mean that he does not want to speak to you personally. In all of your wilderness experience, where he is showing you your heart, he's also showing you his heart. As Madame Guion says, God gives us the cross, and the cross gives us God. You have to be patient as he deals with all the other voices that have drowned out his voice in your heart. It's not that he is not speaking. He always does, even in his silence. It is that you are not able to hear as yet through all the noise. Verse 15. And I will give her her vineyards from thence, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there, as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. The valley of Achor is a reference to bitterness, and this bitterness is that of bitter lamentation in the wilderness. The word Achor means trouble and disturbance. It is this same valley, the valley of Achor, where Achon 
buried the idol within his tent, and he and his whole family were stoned. This is written in Joshua 7. This valley of judgment, the wilderness, he promises to make a door of hope. He promises to give springs of living water in the wilderness. And so the valley of Achor becomes a door of hope. Not just for her, but for those who will also find themselves in the time to come in the wilderness of the tribulation. She who obtained mercy will become a mercy unto them. She leaves Egypt, the world, singing the song of Moses. Note, this Egypt represents everything she has been enslaved to or bound her. Let's go to verse 16 and 17. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shalt call me no more Barley, for I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. Here he is addressing his purpose for this wilderness, which is to make her faithful even as he is. That she will be totally devoted to him as her husband, which is what Ishi means. She, who was not his wife, after the wilderness, becomes his wife. She no longer calls him Bali, which means Lord or more to the point Master. There is a change in her disposition with regards to how she truly sees him. For he is indeed Lord and Master of those whom he has bought, but he longs that she will see him as her husband. She may think that this is how she has always seen him, but he knew about all the other lovers. In John 15, Yeshua says, If you love me, you will do my commandments. Note, a servant does not need to love the Master in order to obey him. He just has to obey. He has to be obedient. However, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. This is the love he is working in you, not only to love him, but to love others with his love. Let's go to verse 18. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness, and in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercy. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. This scripture is in a millennial context where he will restore all things. This applies to Jerusalem from where he will rule. He's betrothing himself to the land. However, understand that this betrothing is also a reference to become one with him, which is an answer to Yeshua's high priestly prayer in John 17. Father, that they may be one as we are one. In order to betroth himself to her, she must no longer be divided, but become one in order to become one with him. This the reason for her isolation, so that she may authentically cry out, My beloved is mine and I am his. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth, and the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. That which was sown in the earth cries out to the heavens. This includes those martyrs sown in the earth as seed. The word hear is saying that the earth will be a witness of this rain by producing corn, wine, and oil. These harvests will come forth out of the earth as resurrected ones. It's a response to the rain from heaven, which is his divine favor. Spiritually, this means his divine favor in whatever she asks of him. And Jezreel means God will sow. 
Remember, she is a witness, meaning a martyr, one who lays her life down and collectively being sown in the ground of this whole earth. The purpose is to bring forth a great harvest into the temple prepared by Solomon, whom he is. Verse 23, And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them, which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. This would be the spiritual cane in the land of milk and honey that he has brought her in, having gone through her personal Jordan, representing complete death. She now walks in his divine favor. Note that this favor he gives to the Gentile bride as she rules and reigns with him on this earth during the millennial reign with those who will be raised up at the last day. The Gentiles are they who were not his people and have obtained mercy. This is why you have to read the book of Isaiah in the context of the Gentile bride that will provoke Israel to jealousy. Can you imagine how the people at that time, specifically the Pharisees, looked at Hosea, a prophet who has done no wrong, who marries a woman of autumn? He is a type and shadow of Yeshua and his Gentile bride. Romans 11 from verse 1. I say then, have God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abram and of the tribe of Benjamin. God have not cast away his people, which he foreknow. What ye not, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they've killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Note, this is only a remnant. They do not serve Baal as per verse 4. He is the Ishi. And this Gentile remnant will be sent into the wilderness of the tribulation to extend mercy to Israel who did not obtain mercy due to the hardness of their heart. This divine favor speaks of a future resurrection life, but in context to our teaching, resurrection life now. Did you know that you can have resurrection life now? Nothing short of a complete death is required. Once again, this death is in degrees until it reaches its completion, its seventh day. The eighth day is the day of new beginning. The number eight is a very important number to God. It's also the number used to signify covenant. Take, take note when I reference scripture with the number eight. In John 8, a reference to the eighth day, a woman of adultery is cast before Yeshua, whom the Pharisees, ready to stone her, trying to set a trap for Yeshua with regard to what the law requires. The law requires judgment, but he gave grace. She is a type and shadow of the Gentile bride, specifically the workers. She is told to sin no more and go. He therefore sends her out to minister the grace she received as a woman of whoredom. Our sanctification is shown through the death of Yeshua on the cross. First his body, then his internal suffering of agony of soul, to whom, to where at last he commits his spirit into the hands of the Father. However, it ends not there, but continues to the grave where the fallen corn of wheat in the ground can only be raised up by him 
at his appointed time. This means the bride in this state in the grave stays there in a disposition of complete death decomposing where no life is detected until he raises her. Where the wilderness is symbolic of the crucifixion, the Jordan River is symbolic of the grave. The word Jordan means to go under. And what a death that is. It is complete and utter even as he gave himself body, soul and spirit. Therefore, to be baptized in water is symbolic of this complete death. It is covenanting with him to take you through a spiritual wilderness and Jordan. I'm sure you can see how Isaiah 2 gives us a description of our sanctification process. And the three keys of sanctification being simplicity, solitude and silence are the gifts that he gives her in this time. A key is a reference to being given authority she has authority in that which she endured and therefore can speak with authority to others when they go through the same so let's summarize this quickly simplicity with regard to simplicity she at first is stripped from that which is worldly first it is the most obvious things but later it progresses to a greater focus on her heart which is her love for those things and people. Knowing that our love is tested during the wilderness, he purifies this love by taking away all other lovers. What's more important to him is the truth about her heart. She has to see how wicked and defiled her heart is and that she is unfaithful. In Psalm 51, David says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. So with regard to this stripping, To a place of simplicity in him, he shows her how much she depends on man and herself. Man's approval, man's love, comfort, friendship, man's recognition and man's wisdom and understanding. He shows her how much she wants to be affirmed or even considered and pitied. Over and over he places her in circumstances that causes her to desperately cry out to be saved. And in case you're wondering, it feels like a literal death. There is a real sense of the soul pining away. But it takes a while for her to realize that he will not save her unless she denies these lovers. She is to forsake mother father, brother, sister, friend, and even hate her own life. That is to say, the soul life she has been living from. She does this numerous times until she has finally left all. Solitude. This then brings her into the place of solitude where she feels utterly destitute and of no worth. She feels nobody understands her, and even if they do, she still feels as if they don't. She reaches a place of complete solitude, where the loneliness swallows her up and drowns her with each wave. These waves of loneliness are not there because of the absence of people. In some cases, there is an absence of people. But it is rather because the world now has died to her. She is dead to all other things, which was a process. She stands in a crowd alone. This is a suffering that cannot be explained and for those undiscerning sees this as extreme. This is because our human nature is made to commune and to belong to someone. Even if that person abuses us, we still want to belong. But he spoils her of everything and she wanders alone through this desert. There are degrees to this loneliness to the point where he has brought her to dust and she exists, yet she does not exist. And yet she's asked to endure. 
At first she cries out to others for help, but not being able to be consoled, she eventually, eventually lets this go too. It dawns on her that she has no life in her except the life that he is in her. This solitude is more than loneliness. The word loneliness and alone has the word one in it. Let's read John 17 from verse 21 to 23, uh, Christ High Priestly Prayer. He prays, Father, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. This oneness which lies at the heart of the gift of loneliness or solitude is the answer of the Father to Yeshua's prayer, which is to make us one, undivided in body, soul and spirit. Those who are one with Christ is one spirit. And where there is only one, there should be only one voice. However, there's still two voices, her voice and his voice. And so in the cleft of the rock, the very mountain that she has climbed to be alone with him, she cries to hear his voice. That's in Song of Songs 2 verse 14. Oh, my dove that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance, let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is comely. Silence. It is in this place of solitude where all the other voices have been silenced. She too, however, has to be silenced as well. This is more than the initial silencing of her running thoughts that stems from an unrenewed mind, emotional healing still needed, and her selfish motives. Once these have been silenced, she enters into a state of silence. Simplicity, solitude, and silence is a state of being. This silence is that of possessing nothing, desiring nothing, and ultimately becoming nothing. She has, but does not possess. Therefore, nothing possesses her or is allowed to enter into her desires, meaning needing it. Therefore, whatever he asks of her, she will give it. Her hand is open. She holds on to nothing and nobody. She is, as Paul, content in all things. She has learned to be content in poverty or riches, in suffering or glory, in pain or peace. Whatever her state, she only desires his will. She is equally content in whatever season he places her. She loves him equally on Calvary as she does on Mount Tabor. Therefore, she is silenced. And just as he said that when he lures her into the wilderness in Hosea 2 and make her as a newborn completely dependent upon him, naked and stripped of all things, she now is in a state of infancy, which is that of purity, holiness and complete trust. She is undivided. She is one. She is weaned from her mother's breast, the mother being the spirit of God from which her life flows. This is in Psalm 131 conveyed. 
David says, Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. I'm sure that many of you have seen the contentment of a child that have just sucked from its mother's breast. Filled to the brim in sweet rest, this child lays in complete peace, no desire, no want, having nothing and yet fully satisfied. This then becomes her way of being and this state never leaves her no matter what suffering she endures. She suffers and yet she does not. She is hidden in Christ with God. Colossians 3.3 So let's talk about the reward for enduring. I mentioned Miguel de Molinar earlier and here is a quote of the solitude that he talks about in his writings called The Inward Way. He says, Know that although exterior solitude doth much assist for the obtaining internal peace, yet the Lord did not mean this when he spake by his prophet in Hosea 2.14, when he said, I will bring her into solitude and speak privately to her. But he meant the interior solitude, which jointly conduces to the obtaining the precious jewel of peace internal. Internal solitude consists in the forgetting of all the creatures, disengaging oneself from them in a perfect nakedness of all the affections, desires, thoughts and one's own will. This is the true solitude, where the soul reposes with a sweet and inward serenity in the arm of its chiefest good. Oh, what infinite room is there in a soul that has arrived at this divine solitude? Oh, what inward, what retired, what secret, what spacious, what vast distances are there within a happy soul that has once come to be truly solitary. There, the Lord converses and communicates himself inwardly with the soul. There he fills it with himself because it's empty, clothes it with light, and with his love, because it's naked, lifts it up, because tis low, and unites it with himself, and transforms it, because it is alone. O delightful solitude, and giver of eternal blessings, O mirror, in which the eternal Father is always beheld, there is great reason to call thee solitude, for thou art so much alone that there is scarce a soul that looks after thee, that loves and knows thee. O divine Lord, how is it that souls do not go from earth to this glory? How come they to lose so great a good through the only love and desire of created things? Blessed soul, how happy Will thou be if thou dost but leave all for God? Seek him only. Breathe after none but him. Let him only have thy sighs. Desire nothing, and then nothing can trouble thee. And if thou dost desire any good, how spiritual soever it be, let it be in such a manner that thou mayest not be disquieted if thou missest it. If with this liberty thou would give thy soul to God, taken off from the world, free and alone, thou will be the happiest creature upon earth, because the Most High has his secret habitation in this holy solitude. In this desert and paradise is enjoyed 
the conversation of God. And it is only in this internal retirement that the marvelous, powerful, and divine voice is heard. If thou wouldest enter into this heaven of earth, forget every care and every thought, get out of thyself that the love of God may live in thy soul. There is a rest that awaits those who are willing to endure the harshness of this wilderness. It will undoubtedly cost you everything. However, to enter into his rest is indeed to rest from all your own works. This is a deep inner working of the Spirit who sanctifies us, body, soul, and spirit. We taste small drops of this serenity during our journey until we are drowned in the ocean of His rest where we become one with Him, just as He was one with the Father when He walked this earth as the patterned Son who lived from every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is the transcended place he brings the bride in where she is still and know that he is God. She comes out of this wilderness he lured her into. She comes not as a weak bride, but a warrior bride leaning on her beloved. That's in Song of Songs 8 verse 5. Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness leaning upon her beloved? I raise thee up under the apple tree. There thy mother, the Holy Spirit, brought thee forth. There she brought thee forth that bare thee. Let's read 2 Corinthians 3 from verse 17. Paul says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Did you catch that? He says, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Not we will be changed. The same can be seen in Romans 8 where Paul talks about this glory. Understanding that we read scripture not only in the was, the history, and the is to come, future, but also in the is, which is present. Let's read Romans 8 from verse 29 to 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first born among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now the scripture is not written in the future context, although the whole of the chapter can be seen as such. The point is that this Glorification is that resurrection life, which is Christ who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He is changing you into the image of his son. The word conformed is the word similar. Remember, daily we are being conformed into his image in the inner man, whilst our bodies are decaying. We do not taste of this glory, this oneness, before there is a complete death. This is different to occasional raptures or visitations from him. I'm talking about a state of being. This glory starts at the moment of resurrection once you have died to all things as discussed here. And this glory goes from glory to glory because she is in him as one and the depth of him is unsearchable. This goes on until she's completely transformed in body as well. In his presence when she meets him face to face as within a mirror. This is the same oneness that Christ spoke to Philip about where he said to Philip, When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. The gospel of grace is not confined to a theology or doctrine whether one enters through works or not. The doctrine of grace is the fact that unto us Gentiles was given the mercy to not have to walk under the yoke of the law, but to by faith 
enter into that which he intended for them, which is to be changed from glory to glory. Let's read 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. In whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of them which believed not, the Jews, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Speaking about the Jews who are under the law and therefore veiled, they are blinded to this glorious gospel of Christ, which is to say, not just the principle of grace, but the glory that accompanies this gospel of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, let's start there. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. So you can see here how Paul and the other apostles have come to this transcendent place. The book of Acts says that these are those who turned the world upside down. It was not just a moment of glory that filled them in the upper room, but they were transformed from glory to glory, possessing nothing, desiring nothing, and being nothing. And therefore Christ, the hope of glory in them, could have full expression through them and live his life through these earthen vessels. This glory was specifically expressed through their body by how they suffered. For it was the expression of the love of God who sent his son to die on the cross for this world. They were troubled on every side, yet not distressed, cast down, but not destroyed. Many have asked whether we will receive transformed bodies as workers. I'm leaning towards no. That may not be a popular view, but we have to understand that he expresses his love through suffering and the spirit of man enduring it joyfully, thereby being the express image of God who sent his son in the flesh to die for us. Priests filled with the glory of God laying their lives down. The life and love of Yeshua was made manifest in their bodies. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 11 says, 11 and 12, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In all your suffering you may see anything but glory. However, this is unseen and therefore we are admonished to not esteem lightly that which he has in store for us now and in eternity in our suffering, which is unseen. The last thing that will be transformed is our body, whereas our inner man is already being transformed. Our body will in fact manifest that which he has done within. Paul speaks of this in the next chapter in 2 Corinthians 5, he says from verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, 
eternal in the heavens. It's talking about the glorified body. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We must understand that even now Christ is in us and we already have eternal life. And this glory that will be the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God is the manifestation of Christ in us in the time to come. This is the Christ child in you being formed during your wilderness years. For this Christ child is born out of death to come forth in resurrection life, just as Christ died and was raised from the dead and received a glorified body. Adam, through sin, fell from his glorified state. He came short of the glory as scripture states that we all are. Christ, the last Adam, came to not only save the lost, but to restore the glory that the first Adam fell short of. As the last Adam and we in him, we will rule and reign in the garden of God and have dominion forever and ever. Christ in us and we in him. Let's read John 17 verse 26, sorry, 24 to 26. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. I understand that one can only understand or grasp something fully to the degree that you walk in it in reality. However, I pray that this teaching has both given insight with regard to your wilderness walk and that like Paul, you are to leave all things behind and endure to apprehend that which you have been apprehended for, which is resurrection life now. Understand that every day what he is busy showing you. You must be able to testify to others what he's teaching you now or showing you about your heart. Be busy with that. Do not go from the one thing to the other, but stay focused. He promised he will complete the work he started in you. Romans 8.29 For whom he did foreknown, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. What this means, in effect, is that when Christ rules in the millennial on this earth, we will be as he is, body, soul, and spirit. Amazing. Amen.